I am pleased to see that you have returned to another edition of Optimal Anesthesia. Today, we'll explore a subject that is very important for anesthesiologists, toxic inhalational injuries induced by pulmonary agents, also called choking agents. We will follow the lead of an intensive care unit anesthesiologist as we investigate the medical treatment, clinical pathological repercussions, and studies around this crucial topic. Choking agents, designed to impede breathing, pose a serious threat to individuals, especially in an ICU setting. For anesthesiologists, understanding the mechanisms and timely interventions is crucial for optimizing patient outcomes. These agents induce a shift of fluid into the small airways, causing choking, impaired gas exchange, and potentially fatal outcomes. Picture this scenario in the ICU. Patients exposed to choking agents may display rapid, shallow breathing, a painful cough, and cyanotic skin. As an anesthesiologist, recognizing the pulmonary physiology resembling acute respiratory distress syndrome becomes paramount. We're here to shed light on these substances, their history, and their limited applications. First up, we have chlorine gas. You might be surprised to know that chlorine is not just for keeping your pool bacteria free. It's a versatile chemical used in the manufacture of pesticides, rubber, and solvents. It's even in your tap water. But remember, the extent of poisoning depends on exposure, so we're not talking about your morning shower. Next on our list is chloropicrin. Ever heard of it? No? Well, that's because it's not your everyday household item. Historically used as tear gas and in chemical warfare, it has limited industrial uses today, mainly as a fumigant in agriculture. Imagine dealing with pests in your garden without the need for gloves and a gas mask. Now, let's talk about something straight out of a spy movie, Phosgene. It's a colorless gas that has been used as a chemical warfare agent. Thankfully, it's not something you'll find on your grocery list. It causes massive pulmonary edema, leading to respiratory failure. No need to panic, though, it's not in your cleaning supplies. Moving on to acrolein, a chemical with limited industrial applications, including the production of acrylic acid. You won't find this in your arts and crafts kit, but it's fascinating how these chemicals play a role in various industries, even if we don't see them on our shelves. And there you have it, a glimpse into the world of choking agents. Remember, these substances are not meant for everyday use and are strictly controlled due to their potential dangers. So, the next time you're enjoying a swim or sipping your water, Take a moment to appreciate the science behind the scenes. Imagine this, you're in different settings, maybe at work, home, or even outdoors. But what if the air around you suddenly turned into a silent assailant, causing harm to your lungs? Let's zoom into the microscopic battlefield within our lungs. When you're exposed to harmful agents, it triggers a chain reaction. First up, there's this thing called massive pulmonary edema, where your lungs get flooded with fluid. It's like your air sacs are throwing a water party, but no one's having fun. Before the party really gets going, there's some backstage drama. The bronchiolar epithelium, which is like the bodyguard of your airways, takes a hit. It's like the security system shutting down, allowing all sorts of troublemakers to wreak havoc. Now, let's talk about the visuals. Your lungs go from the usual pinkish glow to a dark, congested state. It's like they're dressing up for Halloween, but instead of costumes, it's frothy edema fluid and patchy areas of emphysema. Imagine a spooky lung makeover. But it's not just a visual spectacle, there's a symphony of symptoms too. You might experience irritation, like a rock concert for your mucous membranes and eyes. And if things get serious, your respiratory system starts playing its own tune with coughing and substernal aches. Now, here's the rare showstopper, laryngeal spasm. Picture this, a high-stakes moment where your larynx decides it's had enough and goes into a tight lockdown. 
It's like a suspenseful plot twist in the respiratory thriller. But let's not just focus on the drama. Behind the scenes, there's a fascinating story of inflammation, bronchiolar damage, and compromised lung function. Understanding this backstage narrative is crucial for tackling the challenges posed by toxic inhalational exposures. We're diving into the clinical investigations that physicians use to assess lung conditions after exposure to toxic substances. It's a bit like being detectives of the human body. All right, let's start with our first clue, the chest radiograph. Imagine this like a superhero's x-ray vision into the lungs. If our superhero sees hyperinflation, it's like the toxic villain has targeted the smaller airways. Picture it as the aftermath of a battle where the airways have taken a hit. Now, keep your eyes peeled for the batwing infiltrates on the x-ray. These are like the signal flares indicating that there's been damage to the alveolar capillary membrane. It's like the villains have caused a bit of flooding, and our superhero sees the batwings as a clue. And let's not forget about atelectasis. If the x-ray reveals this, it's a sign that the battle zone is more central. Think of it as collateral damage in the heart of the city. Moving on to our second set of clues, the arterial blood gases. It's like our superhero is checking the oxygen levels in the aftermath. Hypoxia is a common result, a bit like a red alert. It's sensitive, but it doesn't point directly to the culprit. If our superhero sees low levels of arterial oxygen and carbon dioxide, it's like an early warning that there's been an increase in interstitial fluid, a sneak attack on the body's fluid balance. Next up, the hematocrit. This is like the detective checking for traces of the villain's escape route. An increased hematocrit reflects hemoconcentration, the bad guys trying to transit fluid into the pulmonary parenchyma. It's a classic move, leaving evidence behind. And now, the pulmonary function tests, the grand finale of our investigation. Picture our superhero measuring the peak expiratory flow rate. If it's decreased after a massive exposure, it's like the aftermath of a big explosion, the airways taking a hit. And when our superhero checks lung compliance and V-Q scanning, it's like using advanced technology to analyze the damage. Decreased lung compliance indicates an increase in interstitial fluid volume, while V-Q scanning is sensitive but not too specific, a bit like having a radar to detect disturbances. We'll break down the medical management steps for handling such cases. So, buckle up, and let's dive in. Step 1, Terminate Exposure. Picture this, a hazardous situation, a potential threat. The first move is crucial. Absolutely. Whether it's removing the casualty from the danger or providing them with a proper respirator, quick action is key. And don't forget about decontamination, getting rid of any harmful substances on the skin or clothing. Now, on to step two, ABCs of resuscitation. Think of it as the medical alphabet for saving lives. Right. Establishing and maintaining the airway is top priority, especially if there are signs like hoarseness or strider. And keeping a close eye on circulation to prevent hypotension is a must. Step three, enforce rest. It's time to slow things down for those suspected of pulmonary edema. Rest is crucial here. We're talking strict limitations on activity and, for those in distress, a gentle evacuation on a litter. Moving on to step four, manage airway secretions. Let's clear the air, literally. Suction and drainage for those copious, watery secretions. And if infections are confirmed, bring in the antibiotics. Step 5. Prevent slash treat pulmonary edema. Breathing trouble is a serious issue. Positive airway pressure is the name of the game here. Early use of a positive pressure mask can make a significant difference. And keep an eye on those diuretics, their value might be limited, so careful monitoring is essential. Now, step 6. Prevent slash treat hypoxia. Oxygen is life, after all. Co-host, oxygen therapy with positive airway pressure is a solid start. 
And if things get serious, don't hesitate to bring in the ventilatory assistance. Step 7. Prevent and treat hypotension. We're talking about maintaining blood pressure here. Intravenous fluid administration is a go-to move. And in some cases, a pneumatic anti-shock garment could be judiciously applied. Step 8. Steroid therapy. Sometimes, you need a bit more firepower. Indeed. Consider steroids for specific exposures, especially if there's evidence to support it. And for bronchospasm, a combination of bronchodilators and steroids might be just what the doctor ordered. But remember, increased infection risk means careful surveillance is a must. In closing, this is optimal anesthesia. Navigating toxic inhalational injury demands a meticulous puzzle-solving approach. Anesthesia, the silent guardian, orchestrates each crucial step. Stay curious, adapt to emerging challenges, and let this guide inspire ongoing dedication to optimal patient care. Until next time, stay tuned for more insights.